we get to reflect on what it means to be free. That we appreciate the freedoms that we have, the freedom to meet today because of those brave soldiers who fought for those freedoms and continue to fight for them. And um, Lord, we just pray blessings over their lives, over their families. For those who have lost a soldier in their family, we pray for comfort today and peace and um, just a sense of, of pride for that person, for what they did. It's not a sinful pride, it's uh, just honoring them, remembering them, passing on their legacy to others. Lord, we give you all the praise and honor and glory. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. So as you know, tomorrow, 4th of July, it's the day our nation celebrates its birth. We appreciate the qualities that we have to be here in this country, in the United States of America, that makes it the unique country that it is today. Besides fireworks and lakes and picnics and family get-togethers, it's just a time for us to remember the freedom that we have. Freedom is perhaps the central founding principle of our nation. It's what we're known for. Freedom is what Independence Day is all about. It continues to be the heart of who we are as Americans. To be an American is to be a free person, to be able to make your own choices, live the life that you choose. We are surrounded by freedom. We live in it. We hear about it. We appreciate it. Maybe not as much as we should. But we live it. We hear it. And we have a holiday like the 4th of July to celebrate it. But freedom is a word that also should strike at us from a different point of view, from a spiritual point of view as Christians. It's something that is central to our faith. People have been searching for freedom for a long, long time, thousands of years. The quest for freedom is a theme throughout the Bible, from Genesis to Revelation. Just three chapters in to God's story, creation, humanity gave up its freedom chasing after sinful things, choosing to rebel against God. From that time forward, the perfect freedom God created in the Garden of Eden, when we could walk with him and we could talk with him and live with him in this perfect place, was gone. The long-term effects were both physical and spiritual. The Old Testament of the Bible records how God's people lost their physical freedom time and time again, worshiping various different gods, chasing after different gods, sacrificing things, worshiping these false idols, as various empires overtook them, most notably the Egyptians, as recorded in the book of Exodus. The loss of physical freedom was often tied to spiritual disobedience and worshiping these false gods. But over and over, the one true God forgave his people and tried to find a way to bring them back to him offering them ways to get back to him, as he does today. When God freed the Israelites from slavery in Egypt, he was foreshadowing the arrival of Jesus Christ, who came to free humanity from sin, the spiritual slavery that leads to death. Today, many people are still living in that spiritual slavery without even realizing it. They chase false gods of money and success, personal comfort, romantic love, only to realize they still have this emptiness inside of them, this emptiness that can never be filled by anything in this world that they're chasing after. So we can see that freedom is tied to what we worship, who we worship. It all ties back to worship. 
this week as I read and studied and tried to find a way to truly explain freedom. I couldn't get past this word worship. That's what God kept bringing back to me over and over. And he kind of bring me, brought me to this conclusion that our level of worship directly reflects our level of spiritual freedom. And will ultimately shape our legacy. I want to explain what I mean by worship. Everyone worships something. Or someone. Everyone. Now Jesus says. Worship the Lord your God. And serve him only. That is what we should worship. That's who we should worship. And that's our goal as individuals and as a church. And most of us think compared to the people in the Old Testament that we're doing pretty good. But if we look back through the Bible and break down all the false gods, the people from the Old Testament, people from the Bible, chased after and worshipped, you may see that we're not so different from them. We may claim not to be idol worshippers, or worshipers of false gods because we do not bow down to statues. We do not erect statues in the image of false gods. We do not sacrifice things for them. But I want to show you how their worship lines up with our idolatrous sinful desire a little more than we think or a little more than we'd like to admit. Let's consider some of the Greek and Roman gods worshipped in that time. Aphrodite, also known as the Romans, as Venus, was the goddess of love and beauty, sensuality, pleasure, and procreation. Ares, or Mars, was the chaotic god of war. Dionysus, also known as Bacchus, was the god of wine and pleasure. Eros, known as Cupid, was the god of love procreation, and sexual desire. Hebe, also known as Javentes, was known as the god of youth. Hermes, also known as Mercury, was the god of commerce or travel. Hypnos, also known as Sominus, was the god of sleep. And it goes on and on. There was a god of strength. There was a god of retribution and vengeance. God of gossip. God of wealth. So we may try to distance ourselves from the way they worshipped, how they worshipped, who they worshipped. But at the level of our desires, are we really that much different than they were? The things they were seeking, the things that they wanted from the gods that they worshipped. If we look over that list, they worship love and beauty and sensuality and pleasure. In war, sleep, strength, power, retribution, vengeance, victory, fame, gossip, wealth, rivalry, and jealousy. It sounds like our world today. They worshipped all these things, but we are still tempted by the same things. We are still tempted to worship these same gods, and put them above our God. The fact of the matter is, like I said, everyone worships something. And that we are all guilty of idol worship from one time or another. Worship, in its true meaning, actually reveals a person's heart. You might be thinking, is that just how I sing? If I stand or sit or if I raise my hands and surrender, if I pray at the altar or in my seat, yes, that is a small part of it. During our worship time, during our service, it's not hard to see authentic worship compared to non-existent worship. Worship is a clear, visual, audible reflection of our hearts. kind of shows where we are. 
in our relationship with Jesus at different times in our life. We have to realize that during that time, that is God's time. That is the time when we are supposed to be coming before the throne with grateful hearts and worshiping and praising the one who gave his life to set us free. It should be an overflow of our faith. It should be on full display. But music and singing are just a couple small parts of what worship is all about and what it looks like. And many times we think of music as worship, the only thing. That's the definition. But it's really just an expression of a bigger thing. It's an expression of worship. We see examples of misguided worship in the church this way. We are drawn to the sound and the experience. And we almost worship the experience and the emotional side of it more than we worship God himself. We sing of what God can do for us while not thinking of what it will demand of us to follow him. We sing with our heart, with everything that we have, as loud as we can. But then we walk out of the church doors still wanting to be the Lord of our own lives. Or we refuse to sing a worship song because it's too old or it's last year or too theological or it's not my style. But all this shows a personal and natural tendency of what we like. It's a self-centered kind of worship, which is not really worship at all. Because guess what? This might be hard for us to hear. It was for me. A lot of this stuff kind of hit home for me this week. But it's not about you. It's not about you. It's not about me. It doesn't matter if we disagree with the song selections, the style, the arrangement, the key that is played in. That is God's song. That is God's time. It's all for him. We need to take our feelings and our personal preferences out of it. How we worship is ultimately a reflection of all these things. Who we give the priority to during these songs will reflect why we are singing in the first place. Like I said, it's an overflow of gratefulness in who we are because of him. It's all about who we came to worship. Is it for him? Or is it for us? Because a lot of times we make it about us. When it should be all about him. But worship overall comes down to this powerful truth. Our songs. How we sing them. How we respond to them are only as worshipful as the lives that we live during the week. It's not just about Sunday. If we only think about God on Sunday, how much worship is going to be, how much power, how much passion, how much is God going to see in that? Let me say it again. Our songs and how we sing them are a direct reflection of how we worship God during the week. If our lives have not worshipped Christ during the week, our songs will have no spiritual value on Sunday. None. It will be like an employee who brings his boss a favorite coffee and a box of chocolates, but the boss knows the employee has been sharing trade secrets with another company. The coffee and the chocolates will mean nothing to that boss. So it is with God when we bring a song that it's not accompanied by an obedient life. It's not a reflection of what we've been through during the week, the time that we've spent with him, the time that we've worshipped him. 
during the week. Our worship on Sunday is confirmed or denied by our life of worship during the week. Worship is expressed through song, but like I said, worship is so much more, so much more than just songs. It's a way of life. It affects everything that we do, everything that we say, how we treat people, how we love people. It's a life that time and time again declares the worth of our God through our decisions, through our thoughts, through our personal behaviors. This form of life worship is happening all throughout the day, every single day. The words we say, the friends we choose, the way we spend our money, the way we treat the people who we live with, how we treat others. All of this reveals what we worship and what desires rule our hearts. In Luke 6, 44 through 45, Christ explains it this way. The good man brings good things out of the good stored up in his heart. And the evil man brings evil things out of the evil things stored up in his heart. For out of the overflow of his heart, the mouth speaks. Or we could say, whatever rules your heart will control your behavior. Whatever you worship, whatever rules your heart, will control your behavior. Worship is a way of life and is constantly on display. Unfortunately, it is. No matter who we're around, people are going to see. that if Christ is the most important desire in somebody's life, they're going to see that. Everything else will respond accordingly. One's allegiance to Christ and the church that Christ has placed them in will be apparent in somebody's behavior, their speech, their thoughts, their actions, even their emotions. Let's consider a couple, I found a couple illustrations and try to really break this down and explain it. The Christian mother waits to pick up her children after school while she waits. All the other mothers are talking badly about one of the mothers who is not present. The mothers then turn to the Christian mother to hear her opinion of this absent mother. Her desire for approval and belonging will now compete with her desire for God's commandments to love your neighbor, to not gossip, and to speak honorably. Her decision is an expression of worship. Her decision is an expression of worship. Or a person neglects their daily devotional time with God, avoids joining any kind of life group or Bible study because they do not have time. They do have time for Netflix, surfing the web, television, fishing, playing games. But with all their activities, they just don't have time to draw near to God. Their neglect of God is an expression of their worship. Our Christian teenage siblings continue to argue and fight on an ongoing basis. They're always at each other. Their desire to win, to gain the upper hand, to get their way has become stronger than their desire for Christ and his command of reconciliation and putting others before themselves. Their fighting is an expression of their worship. Every situation with a moral dynamic to it is a chance for us to show who we worship. We expect our worship, express it by how we post things on social media, what we put on Facebook, what we put on Instagram, Snapchat. We express worship as we decide whether to let our coworkers know 
that we are followers of Christ or to remain silent. We express it in how we spend our money, how we prioritize our time. We keep our minds pure and also how we choose our career, how we choose our words. Every tempting situation that we face, every time we have to make a choice or a decision, there's an opportunity to worship. It becomes an opportunity to make a statement concerning God's worth, how important he is to us, how close we are in our personal relationship with him. It's an opportunity to worship where we can reaffirm ourselves and show to the world that God is more precious than anything else, than anything this world has to offer. So I just want to take a minute to review just the the important truths that I want you to take with you today, the things I want you to think about this week. Number one is everyone worships something. Number two, the sincerity of our worship on Sunday is confirmed or denied by our life of worship during the week. The third is one's allegiance and commitment to Christ and the church body he has placed them in will be apparent in their speech, their actions, their thoughts, and their emotions. The four, whatever desires rule your heart will control your behaviors, good or bad. And the last one, every situation with a moral dynamic to it is an occasion for us to worship. And as I read that list, the most powerful illustration that I saw this week was the fact that some of you may look at this list and be full of joy and hope and be thinking, this is where I'm at. I need to grow, but I really am. When I try to make a decision, I'm thinking, how can I worship God? How can I prioritize God? How can I reflect Him in my life? You may be full of joy and filled with a spirit of freedom. But as others are looking at this same list, you may be overwhelmed with spiritual conviction. Conviction to change because you see you are trapped in spiritual slavery. It's the same list of very different levels of freedom. It's the same prayer that can bring us all closer to God no matter where we fall on that list. We can always get better. We can always change. It's a prayer I repeat. Multiple times throughout the week, it keeps me focused on our mission, and it keeps Satan from getting a foothold in my life. Psalms 139.23, search me, God, show me my heart. That's what I say throughout the week, search me, Lord, show me my heart. What needs to change? Am I holding on to some kind of anger or resentment? Do I need to forgive somebody? Is there a way I can serve that I'm not serving? Search my heart. Am I being selfish? It's something we need to ask God every day. Try me and know my thoughts. See if there is any grievous way in me and lead me back. Let me see what it is. Let me confess what it is. Let me repent and turn back to you. Let me make the situation right. Take this away from me. And it's all right to allow God to bring regret to your heart and a desire for holy change in him, to build your relationship with him. Surrender the struggle to him. Trusting that he can bring a change as the Holy Spirit brings conviction of sin to our lives and our hearts. We confess our sins, we repent, and fully receive his forgiveness. As we are promised in 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sins, he is faithful 
and just to forgive us our sins, and to cleanse us from unrighteousness. All we have to do is confess the thing that we're holding on to, the thing that we're struggling with, the thing that's keeping us from true freedom. We remove from our lives anything that is leading us into sin. We then fix our eyes on Jesus by spending daily time with God in prayer and his word, by surrounding ourselves with other followers of Christ, by joining a small group, by growing in a small group, by getting to know each other personally, challenging us, pushing us, holding us accountable, doing it together. Because we can't do it on our own. The change of our heart's desires, the pattern, the cycle that we get stuck in can only be accomplished as the Holy Spirit works in our lives. We have to allow him to work. As we obey the scriptures, we place ourselves in the path of the Holy Spirit. And God changes us one day at a time, one moment at a time. Much like it says in Ezekiel 36, 26, and 27. When we surrender, when we ask the Holy Spirit to work inside of us and change us. It says, I will give you a new heart and a new spirit, and I will put within you. And I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh. I will remove the heart of stone from you and give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and be careful to obey my rules. I pray that we're a church and a people who are prepared to worship Christ every moment of every day, that it reflects in our lives who the priority is. When we're forced with a decision and we're faced with different obstacles, that we think about how is this going to honor God? What would Jesus want me to do in this situation? How can I reflect him in a positive way that will lead people to him and not push them away from him? Every moment of every day, we have a choice. And that's where our legacy lies. Because freedom is a choice. God gives us freedom to choose our own path. He gives us free will. Those who choose Christ are not forced to obey him. But God makes it very clear the best life is one that's devoted to honoring Christ, to following his example. As the Apostle Paul explained to some of the first Christians in 1 Corinthians 6.12, he says, I have the right to do anything, you say, but not everything is beneficial. I have the right to do anything, but I will not be mastered by anything. And in Galatians 5.13, you, my brothers and sisters, were called to be free. You were called to be free. But do not use your freedom to indulge the flesh. Rather, serve one another humbly in love. Serve one another humbly in love. God's word points to freedom in Christ. And God doesn't leave us wondering how to get this freedom, how to experience this freedom. It all starts with acknowledging our brokenness and admitting that we were slaves to sin and that we are holding on to something and that we do take time to ask God, search my heart. Search my soul. Search my spirit, Lord. Show me what needs to change. Show me what I'm holding on to. Show me what I need to let go of and give back to you. And it ends with choosing Jesus and following him daily. Pick up your cross daily and follow me. Only Jesus can break the bonds of slavery to lead us to true freedom in Christ, now and forever. So I pray for chains, 
to break in your life, I pray that you will see the things that need to change, that you can recognize maybe decisions or thoughts or behaviors or choices that are not honoring God, that are not honoring Jesus, and you want to change those things. Be set free by the mighty name above all names, the name of Jesus. And that we bring God the worship he alone deserves every moment of every day because he deserves it. Knowing that worship is a way of life. And we alone get to choose the legacy that we leave. Each one of us, each choice by how we worship. Because it does affect how we live. It does affect everything around us. It may seem like a small choice or a small decision or a small conversation. But it can have huge consequences. I just pray that we live a life that declares the worthy of the worthiness of our God. Through our decisions and acts, behaviors. And not only will worship set us free, but God will then work in and through us. If we're distracted by other gods, by other idols, by other things that we're chasing after, God can never truly work through us to be the church that he's called us to be. But if we can't find a way to set ourselves free, then we can't set anyone else free. It has to start with us. But the choice is up to us. Freedom, spiritual freedom, is a choice that each one of us has to make. We can choose to stay where we are, or we can choose to experience the true freedom in Christ. Let us pray. Dear God, thank you for your word. Lord, thank you for your church. And I pray for each and every person here. That they will examine their lives. Whether against the list that we went through. Or if they will just examine their lives by praying to you. To search their hearts. Lord. Who are they worshiping? What are they worshiping? What has taken your place? What is keeping them from experiencing freedom? Is it anger? Is it hurt? Is it resentment? Is it unwillingness to forgive? Lord, whatever it is, I pray that they can give it to you this morning. Stop holding on to it to get out of this place of spiritual slavery they find themselves in. Because it will just keep going on and on. And we know the only thing we have of any value in this world is time. And we've wasted so much of it already by holding on to these things. And we don't get that much of it. How many lives can we affect and change? How many opportunities have we missed already by staying in this place of slavery? Lord, I pray that they will use their free will this morning to worship the Lord their God only to let go of these things so they can start to reflect a life of worship They can set other captives free. Lord, open their hearts, open their minds. Holy Spirit, have your way in them. Convict them. Lead them back to you. Lord, it's in your name that we pray. In the name of Jesus. Amen.